Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to turn, and over these next uh, few weeks, we're actually going to do a little series on a very, very, very short, small book in the Bible, okay? <laughs> it's called the book of Philemon. Has anyone heard of it? So, yeah, many, some of you have, hopefully you have. In fact, it's so small, you'd, you'd almost miss it, okay? So uh, now my Bible, it's probably very different in your Bible. My, my Bible says Philemon is on page 1000, okay? So obviously yours is probably very different. Um, but we're looking at the book of Philemon. It's a letter that Paul addressed to someone called Philemon. And I think, you know, re- recently I, I've just been studying this letter and I just felt that there's so much uh, truth in this letter that will keep this going for a while, <laughs> okay? Because I really want to unpack it. Um, it's a wonderful, uh, precious letter. Well, last month it was uh, my birthday. Anyone have their birthday last month? Yes, well done, Christine. Yeah, all, all the good people are born in August, aren't they, Christine? <laughs> Hey, but it's, uh, it was my birthday last month, and uh, normally I like to um, head over to the Lake District for a few days, and uh, I decided to do something last month for the first time. Uh, I decided to, I was going to climb uh, Scarfell Pike. Has anyone ever done that? Any, no, no, okay, right. So I decided I was going to climb Scarfell Pike, so, which happens to be the tallest mountain in England, but by no means the tallest in the United Kingdom. I think Ben Nevis and... Snowden uh, beat, beat Scarfell Pike, and um, I don't really pronounce it right as well, that's another thing. But um, I got myself ready that morning, I got my rucksack, I put some food in my rucksack, I got some climbing boots, uh, I sort of made the decision that I'll have a go, okay, I didn't really fully commit myself to the idea of actually climbing it, but I said I'll have a go, I turned up, I parked the car, uh, you know, just at the bottom of the mountain in this car park. On my Google Maps, it said it'd be about a two and a half mile walk uh, to the summit, okay? But obviously, you're going quite, quite some height, so it'll take me about an hour and a half, maybe a couple of hours to, 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 uh, to climb. And there was lots of people walking up and down. So I went up this narrow path, came to this river, make sure I crossed the river. The path gradually got more and more steeper, uh, and eventually... It, it, there was these boulders, these rocks, and literally just scrambling to get to the top. And eventually, I made it to the summit. Yes. Now, I, yes, you can clap. Yes, it's perfectly fine. So, when I got to the summit, it was really windy. In fact, you get there, it was like the wind was just blowing. I had this coat. I was carrying my coat. I thought it was going to blow off. It was that, it was that windy. And, uh, but when I, after climbing it, I realized actually that if you want to accomplish something in life, there has to be just a smidgen of belief that you can do it, isn't there? Doesn't there? There has to be just a little bit of faith that you can, uh, you can have a, have a go at doing it. And though, although when I initially uh, attempted to climb the, the mountain, initially I just thought, I'll have a go, okay? I didn't have any real belief that I was actually going to go all the way, but What I found is as I took a step, one step at a time, uh, gradually ascending to the summit, I found that my sense of belief gradually started to increase, okay? My faith increased. I had to uh, trust in my app, (laughs) in my Google Maps app that was taking me in the right direction. I had to trust that the path that I was on was going to take me to where I needed to go. I needed a little bit of encouragement from a few others along the way, but with a little bit of perseverance... And a little bit of keep on walk, and, 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 keep, and, and keep on walking and keep my feet going, with a mustard seed of faith, I eventually, eventually made it to the summit, to Scarfell Pike. You know, Jesus' brother once uh, said this, James, he said, that as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You see, imagine for a moment you're going to catch a bus. Okay, uh, you look at the sign of the bus, it says it's going to go to a certain place in Mansfield, wherever it is, okay, the number three, number four, whatever, okay. You believe that that bus will take you to a certain location. Because you believe that, you will behave on that belief and you will step on that bus to take you where it needs to go. So you have, there had to be a faith there, doesn't there, before you can actually act out. You see, where this faith, where this belief behavior follows. 
And so it's, um, it's important to realize that if someone says, oh, I want to accomplish a certain goal in life, but they're not taking any steps towards accomplishing that goal, then we've got to really ask, do they really believe that goal? Do they really believe that that is something that they can do? But when it comes to our spiritual walk and our spiritual journey, we know that it is our faith in Jesus that leads us to a heavenly destination, don't we? It's leading us to a heavenly summit. But you know what? It is not a faith that just sits back. It's a faith that actively trusts in Christ and, and it acts itself out in how we live our lives in actually bettering and improving our relationships and the world around us. Now hear what I'm saying. Listen to what, carefully to what I am not saying, okay? I am not saying that your good works earns your place in heaven, okay? That's not the case. Could you imagine living with someone who thought they were good enough to get to heaven? <laughs> okay, I think they would be a bit of a difficult person to live with, wouldn't, wouldn't they? None of us here in ourselves are good enough to earn a place in heaven. Jesus has secured a place in heaven for all of us. He has earned it on our behalf through his life and through his death. But I wonder, what I'm saying is this. When you put your trust in Christ, when you put in G, your, your trust in Jesus, good works follow, okay? A, a difference is made. That something happens in how we interact in our relationships with, with people. See, for our faith to be meaningful, those around us need to see a change in our lives. That's important, isn't it? You know, there's a, someone I've recently been getting to know over these last few weeks of some of the work I've been doing here in Mansfield, but this person was saying how when they came to faith in Christ, that his girlfriend noticed a difference in his life. Well, that's the way it's meant to be, isn't it? Because there's a life change, there's a tra- something changes in us when we take our, when we generally put our trust in Christ. It affects your outlook to life. You start to be more loving and more hopeful in life. And so the question really is this: Do we really believe in Jesus? Have we really put our hope in Him? Because faith without works is dead. It's a dead faith. Now, as I mentioned before. We're going to be doing a, a series of teaching on this uh, tiny, tiny letter. I think it's only about 22 or 24 verses called the book of Philemon. And it's an interesting letter because uh, uh, over these next few weeks, I'm going to do this a lot, uh, series called Life in Unison, okay? So we live a life where we are reconciled in our relationships with God and each other. But it's an interesting letter because it's a very obscure letter that Paul writes to a slave owner. Okay, now think about this. Now we know that slavery has a a negative connotation of its history and its past and some of the horrendous things that happened. But Paul is writing a letter to a slave owner. And actually, as he's writing this letter to the slave owner, he is beginning to unpack the implications of the gospel in in that world. And it has an impact upon our lives. Because when we see the world around us, we see that there's a division, isn't there, between the haves and the have-nots. There's a div- between those who are in authority and those who are not in authority. Between those, and we see all sorts of tensions in our world. We see racial tensions, social unrest, economic inequality. All of these are playing their part in stoking the flames of disquiet and discord in our world today. And so this short, obscure letter written to a slave owner in the first century Greco-Roman world, I believe provides a foundation, that, the foundational answer to the discord that we see in the world around us. This short letter gives us a glimpse of the implications of working out the gospel of Christ in community, in Christian community and in the wider community. You know, at the, ti- at the time when hatred and rancor was at its highest during the, and suspicion during the Second World War, there was a German pastor and theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, okay? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he actually was, was actually put to death by Hitler. But during his life, when he was in Germany, he, he, a number of years, he, he wrote a book called Life Together. 
And in this book, he said something really profound. He said this, Without Christ, there is discord between God and man, and between man and man. Christ opened up the way to God and to our brother or sister. You know, there was Bonhoeffer's words uh, uh, under, underlie this truth. That when, as a community of believers, we understand the power of the gospel, it brings healing. It brings healing in our relationships. Because the gospel of Christ is ultimately about reconciling us to God and actually reconciling us to each other. And of all the communities in the world, do you know what? The Christian community should be the one that stands out the most. Would you agree? Actually, it should be the one that brings the most healing and reconciliation into this world. And so we're going to unpack what it means to live as a community that brings healing. And, and, and for us to understand that the first truth that we need to take hold of is that faith without works is dead. So how then, how then can we become, how can we grow in this relational faith, okay? How can we grow in this faith that actually has an impact on our relationships in a positive way. Well, let's read the first opening words of Paul's letter to Philemon, okay? And I'm just going to read the first uh, few verses. I'm going to read to, as far as verse 6. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I love this. I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. That's great, isn't it? And Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our brother, our fellow soldier. Church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Now, I want you to notice something about what Paul says in his opening words to Philemon, and that is this. The thing that Paul thanks God about Philemon's life is his faith. Is his faith. That Philemon was a man who behaved as if the gospel was true. Okay? That was the characteristic of his faith. His faith wasn't just about the content of his beliefs, about what he believed about God and what he believed about Jesus, although that's very important. His faith also had a continual outliving and outworking in how it affected his relationships. Philemon's faith and that of Aphian and this fellow soldier by the name of Archippus, their faith had a practical outworking. It refreshed other people around them. And for this reason, Paul says, I give thanks to God. I give thanks to God. And for every believer, faith expresses itself in how we behave. And so because faith without works is dead, what can we learn from these opening words of Paul about how to grow in relational faith? The first thing that we can learn, and this might sound very obvious, <laughs> but if you want to have a relational faith that makes a difference to your world, Trust in Christ's work. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Very obvious, isn't it? Trust in Jesus' work. Now, one of the things I noticed about the people throughout history who have made the biggest difference in the lives of their world, who have really gone into dark places and helped make the world a better place, is that they had a trust in Jesus. They had a trust in Christ. You know, it wasn't that they said they believed in Jesus. It wasn't that they said that they, you know, they adhered to the teachings of the church. No, it was a, a confidence that they put in Christ, an ongoing trust in Christ that had a practical outworking. I think of the likes of Brother Andrew, the vicar of Baghdad, okay, who was right in the middle of Baghdad, in the middle of that broken place, 
just being salt and light in that environment. Or someone like Mother Teresa, who we're all familiar with. You see, when Paul says to Philemon, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He reveals that the primary object of Philemon's love and faith was in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was the Lord of Paul. He was the Lord of Philemon. He was the Lord of all these people that he was writing to. And it was Jesus who was their bedrock and their security in, in, in life. In fact, it is Jesus who gave himself for, for, for Philemon. Okay, It is Jesus who loved them and saved them and paid the sin's penalty and delivered them from sin's power. And thus, this faith and love that is a deeply personal faith and love is a faith and love that is rooted in Christ. It's rooted in Jesus. I recently came across a survey uh, where there was some research done about the impact of the environment that a child grows in the first year of their life and how that affects their outlook of life. And if a child, in the first 12 months of their life, they live in a secure home, if they feel loved, if they feel valued, you know, it totally transforms the rest of their life. They're much more adventurous. They're much more inquisitive. They, they, they like to, you know, they play more. But research was found that but if you contrast that with a child that grew up in a home that was not secure, that didn't experience love, they were much more fearful, they were much more protective. They were much more uh, likely to uh, feel more vulnerable and less open and, and less, uh, less likely to learn and explore. And I want to say to you this morning, you know, you may not have grown up in a home where you had that security, that love, that you felt that, 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 that would have given you a good foundation of life. But I want you to know that when you understand all that Jesus has done for you, when you understand all how much he loves you, that, that, that he loves you so much that he laid down his life for you. I don't know about you, but that gives an incredible security to my life. And that's important because we know, don't we, that in our relationships with people, people will let us down, won't they? <laughs> we'll all say things that aren't always nice. We don't always honor our word or say that we'll do what we, we, we do. But if your security is in Christ, if, you're, if, if Jesus is the foundation of your life, you're putting your trust in someone who will never let you down, never fail you, who's always there for you, who's promised he'll love you to the very end. And you know what? That helps you in your relationships with other people. Because you're okay. We know that people will fail from time to time. It's going to happen, isn't it? But we don't allow uh, other people's failures to pull us down. Why? Because our confidence, our trust is in Christ. That he is the bedrock of our, of our lives. You know, when the uh, disciple of love, John, said this, that love because he first loved us, he discloses that by placing your trust in Christ, you are receiving his love of first, which is of first importance if you are to effectively love those around you and build bridges. An unshakable confidence in Christ puts a foundation for you to grow in love in your relationships with other people. And so given that faith without works is dead, by modeling your life on Christ, making him your leader and your savior, you can play a part of actually nourishing a healthy community of building relationships, of sharing that love to people around you. And so, trust in Christ, okay? If you haven't done so, make sure you do that. Put your trust in Christ. But the second thing we can do to have this relational faith that makes a difference in our world is become a trustworthy person. That's helpful, isn't it? Become a trustworthy person. Hundreds of years ago, and um, the founding fathers of the United States of America, they signed the Declaration of Independence. I think it was George Washington was the first president. And then later on, it was John Quincy Adams. I think he became the president of the United States. 
And John Quincy Adams had a friendship with a, a companion of his by the name of Thomas Jefferson. And uh, they were always good friends. But when John Quincy Adams became president and his, his friend Thomas Jefferson became vice president... Uh, because they were different political persuasions, Thomas Jefferson was just a thorn in John Quincy Adams' side, okay? In fact, he, he, the friendship just soured. And he didn't get the support that he needed from his old friend. And, and what happened was that the relationship just ended in bitterness and rancor. However, a number of years later, a friend of uh, John Quincy Adams says, you know what, why don't you try and rekindle your friendship with Thomas Jefferson. And so what he did, he wrote a letter to him, just saying, look, uh, I think it was a Happy New Year's letter. I just want to send you a little card to say, look, Happy New Year, I'm thinking about you. It'll be good to talk someday. Well, to his surprise, Thomas Jefferson responded, and they struck up a friendship. They rekindled a friendship that had died for many years. And when Adams was asked, how could you be on such good terms with a man who treated you so badly when you were office, in office. And he said this, and I think this is incredible. I do not believe that Mr. Jefferson ever hated me. On the contrary, I believed he always liked me. <laughs> okay? And then he wished to be president of the United States, and I stood in his way. But, he says, and he says this, and so he did everything he could to pull me down. But if, I love this, but if I should quarrel with him for, for that, I might as well quarrel with every man I've had anything to do with in life. <laughs> this is human nature, he said. I forgive all my enemies and hope they find mercy in heaven. Mr. Jefferson and I have grown old and retired from public life, and so we are now upon our ancient terms of good will. That's great, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? Adams was a trustworthy man, wasn't he? He was a trustworthy person. He saw past the, you know, the, the, you know, the whole panache of political office. He saw the value of that relationship is more important than anything else. His kindness to Jefferson was not conditioned by how he, he was treated by him. And the same is true for you. If you're going to grow in a relational faith that loves others, it's a faith that, that gives even when you don't get anything in return. Paul says to Philemon, he says of Philemon, he says that, I hear, so it was a good news about Philemon, I hear about your love for all his holy people. <laughs> I hear about your love for all his holy people. In other words, Philemon was known as someone who refreshed the hearts of other people. There was a, he was known for his practical acts of kindness. And Paul says, I hear about that. And notice it, it's for all people, okay? which would have included people who maybe have not been so nice to Philemon. In fact, later on, as we go through, as we look through the book of Philemon, we'll notice that someone did something really nasty to Philemon, okay? And that's why Paul was writing this letter, because Paul was encouraging Philemon to, to build a bridge to someone who treated him badly in the past. But being that trustworthy person is about going that extra mile, extending kindness to those who wronged you. You know, I was thinking about this. I was thinking, you know, I think it's possible to love someone without trusting them. Okay? So, for example, let's imagine you've got a family member or someone that you love deeply and care for immensely, but unfortunately they have, they're going the wrong way. They maybe hurt you with their words. They may be taking something from you that, that, uh, that didn't belong to them. And actually, because you love them so much, and because you can't trust them, it creates such immense pain in your heart, in that relationship. And I think that was exactly what our lives were like with God, weren't they? God so loved us that even when we were his enemies, he sent his son into this world to redeem us to himself. The other side of it is this. I think it's also possible to trust someone without necessarily loving them. 
Think about this. If you go to the doctor or have to have surgery, you entrust your life into the hands of the surgeon, yes? You hope that the surgeon is going to do a good job in making sure that they get you into, into uh, good health. But it would be wrong to say that you love the surgeon, okay? To the same extent that you love you know, a family member or a spouse or a loved one or, or a child. And the reason for this is because though, although trust is something that is earned... Love is something that is freely given, isn't it? And freely, uh, freely received. And when you become a trustworthy person in your character, though you, you can never, though you can never demand love from others, you can never require love from others, you can at least create the conditions of love in that relationship by being trustworthy in your character, by being honest in your dealings with others. And that's why it's so important. That's why we go back to our first point. That's why if we're to have this relational faith that makes a difference in our relationships with each other, we have to find our security first in Christ. It's out of that relationship with Jesus that enables us to show generosity in our relationships with, with others. And that, that, that relationship with Christ helps you even to love the unlovable. It's a, because, and, and when that happens, you have a faith that has a practical outworking in our relationships with other people. That's why only in Jesus can you say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. We know, don't we, that naturally speaking, that's not possible. <laughs> okay? That's not possible. But when we're in Christ, it is possible. And actually, you can become a trustworthy person who demonstrates a relational faith that builds bridges. But the third thing that we can do, as well as trusting in Christ, as well as becoming a trustworthy person, is to practice trustworthy love that refreshes. A faith that refreshes is a faith that has, has a practical expression to that. Paul adds to Philemon, he says this, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Now, I want you to notice, I've underlined that word partnership. Because our faith is not a private matter, okay? It's not a, you know, a, it's not a matter that we just have for ourselves and we lock ourselves from everyone else. It, our faith has a practical outworking that links and shares with other people. In fact, the word uh, partnership here is this posh Greek word called koinia. Has anyone heard of this word? I know some of you have, okay. It's a very popular word in the New Testament. And it's the same word from which we get the word fellowship. Fellowship. And, uh, and every time you see this word koinia, it's, it relates to helping the needs of the poor. Or it could be uh, collectively connecting in our worship with God. We had a koinia moment this, mo uh, moment this morning. We're here, aren't we? Giving our worship to God. It could be in the breaking of bread, which we're going to do later on. It could be in being involved in Christian service. Or collectively experiencing the Holy Spirit. Or as a church, collectively making the gospel known to our world. Or even, Paul also uses this word to describe sharing in the sufferings of Christ. It's a wonderful, beautiful word. And what I think Paul is saying in these words is that when you combine your faith with someone else's faith, it has what I call a multiplying effect. We use this uh, posh word called synergy. <laughs> okay? Synergy. You know, the, this, there's a power that comes where the combined efforts of our faith working together, has a bigger effect than the sum of the parts. Let me explain this. You get a horse, and uh, the horse pulls a, a weight of, say, 6,000 pounds, okay? Now, if you get two horses, how many pounds do you think it, could, it can pull? 12,000? 12, okay? Actually, it can pull 18,000. Three times more with two of them than just... Just one of them, that makes sense, okay? In fact, so what, what happens is this. The combined efforts of two horses doesn't just have a doubling effect. It has a greater effect. It has a threefold increase. That is the power of synergy. 
And that is the power of our faith working together, okay? It has a multiplying impact on the world around us. And so when we combine our faith with helping the poor in Christian service, in generosity, in sharing the gospel, it has a magnifying effect. So I, I want to encourage us all here today. Let's have a relational faith that makes a difference in our world. Let's become trustworthy people. Let's put our trust in Christ, yes? He's a trustworthy person to put, to put our trust in. As we put our trust in Christ, we become trustworthy ourselves as people. And in doing so, we practice a trustworthy love that refreshes and strengthens those around us. And I want you just to imagine for a moment, what would it be like for us as a church if we were to demonstrate that sort of practical love that refreshes the lives of others? Now, I've already uh, st stated that when we live out this faith, it starts by putting our trust in Christ. And I want to go back to these words because Paul says this, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share, we share for the sake of Christ. The foundation of this sharing life is our shared faith with Jesus Christ. And when we open our hearts to that collective experience of Jesus and his Holy Spirit, we can actually live out a communal faith that changes our world around us. Now, you remember at the start of this message, I, I explained that, that we're not saved by our good works. We are saved for good works. And that it is Jesus and our faith in him that secures for us an eternal home. But you know what? Jesus is the narrow path that we need to stay on. Jesus is the food that helps us and gives us the strength to keep on going. Jesus is the Google Maps <laughs> who makes sure that we're staying on the right direction. And it is your trust in him that enables you to get where you need to go. And that enables you to behave in such a way that enables you to reach heaven's summit. And I want to encourage you today, if you've not yet put your trust in Jesus, then I want to invite you to respond to him. If you're watching online, I want to invite you to respond to his goodness and his love. And I want to invite you just to turn away from all that you know is wrong. Change your mind towards God. Put your trust in Jesus. Open your heart to receive of his spirit and begin a journey of living an active faith, a relational faith that makes a difference in your world. But let's pray. Amen. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And Lord, we just ask and pray that you will help us to live out this practical faith. Help us to live this faith that actually reaches out into the brokenness of this world, that goes that extra mile, Lord. Father, I pray that you will grow us into becoming a trustworthy people who practice a trustworthy love that just helps meet the practical needs of our world around us and mature us in our walk with you. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. If there's anyone here uh, this morning, you've not yet come to that place of uh, putting your trust in Christ, maybe watching online, I'm going to pray this prayer. I'm going to invite you to repeat these words after me in your heart. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong in my life. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I can be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive Please come into my life and live with me forever.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.